25 years ago tomorrow, on March the 8th, 1961, Sir Thomas Beecham died, aged 81. Although a musician with an international reputation, he was born and bred in St. Helens. It was there, indeed, that at his father's instigation, the 20-year-old Beecham made his rather unexpected professional debut, conducting the Halley Orchestra when their own conductor, Hans Richter, fell ill. Tonight, as our tribute to a great Lancastrian, we're showing again a programme we made about him here at Granada in 1958. Beecham was legendary for his witticisms and rudeness. He was quite content to go along with and even encourage the establishment of his reputation as a sort of sacred monster. Today, we're perhaps rather cooler in our admiration for conductors with larger-than-life personalities, and I suspect there are many people who think of Beecham as a showman first and a conductor second. Luckily, the recordings we have of his sensitive performances of Mozart, Delia, Strauss and Elgar show otherwise. History books will record Beecham as the man who brought Diaghilev's Ballet Russe to London in 1911, as the founder of the London Philharmonic and Royal Philharmonic Orchestras, and as the champion of the music of Delius. But more intangibly, it was in his instinctive understanding of orchestras that his greatness lay. He had no formal musical training, and it was perhaps his sensual approach to music that won him not just the respect, but the genuine affection of his players. They knew that for all his bluster, he respected them too, and reveled in their partnership. Here then, in its original form, is the 1958 programme, Sir Thomas at Lincoln's Inn. Sir Thomas Beecham, musician and genius. For 60 years, music's champion against sloppiness, snobbery and humbug. The man who shouted, shut up, at the white ties and tiaras at Covent Garden. The man who faced a stolid Birmingham audience and cried, let us pray, and got away with it. Now, nearly 80, he's home again. Jaunty and defiant as ever. A character, an institution, and the greatest conductor in the world. Today, he visits Lincoln's Inn. This morning at Lincoln's Inn, some rather unusual things were happening. The judges and barristers, who normally lunch at the long tables, were turned out by 70 musicians of the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. The lawyers had invited Sir Thomas to conduct before the law's top people at a grand concert tonight in Lincoln's Inn. The rehearsal was called for 10 o'clock this morning. At three minutes past 10 precisely, Sir Thomas made his characteristic and unhurried approach to the podium, a vantage point from which for 60 years he has terrified, delighted and inspired thousands of different players. What the devil's that? What? I thought it was an automatic baton. <laughs> Believe me, of any responsibility and duty. I trust you realize, gentlemen, after saying good morning, it's <laughs> an uh, solemn, important, and impressive occasion. I've spent half a sleepless night looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> Mingled emotions of curiosity, delight, and horror. <laughs> now, what do we play? Of course it's too high. What do you think I am? <laughs> Samson? Oh. Sometimes. House <laughs> <laughs> ballet music. Um, bum, bum, one of the bar. Used to be anyway. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now that's Peter Brook, the theatre producer, who's going to talk to Sir Thomas later on. Sir Thomas rehearses, the legal day ticks by in Lincoln's Inn. This very English institution is one of London's four great homes of the law, a place where lawyers live, work, study and enjoy themselves, an eating place, meeting place, office, council chamber, college and club. For six centuries life here has been much the same. Students have arrived, taken their exams and been called to the bar. Some stuck to the law and became great judges. Some became great political powers in the land, like William Pitt, Prime Minister at 24, like Sir Thomas More, saint and martyr. And some just became oddities, like William Prynne, the Puritan, who wrote in this angry pamphlet that all actresses were whores and had his ears cut off. Well, today, many of the students working in the library have come thousands of miles. They're learning the elements of English law, perhaps England's most valuable export, Lawyers of the future, studying in the shadow of great men of the past. Gladstone, Disraeli, Melbourne, Penn. Now this pretty girl will soon be leaving for a sun-baked courthouse halfway across the globe. She'll take with her something of Lincoln's Inn. In this chapel, the great poet John Donne preached the first sermon. In the great anthill of the whole world, I am an ant. I have my part in the creation. I am a creature. In the great field of clay that man was made of, I am a clod. I am a man. I have my part in humanity. These cloisters were once a favorite place for careless mothers to dump unwanted babies. The benchers took care of them, gave them all the surname Lincoln, fed them, reared them, and had them apprenticed. In the great hall, Sir Thomas's rehearsal finished at half past twelve. And a little later in the afternoon, Peter Brook went to see him in his hotel room. He was working over some scores for tonight's concert with Mr. Brownfoot, and, and the orchestra's and librarian. Just the same in each case, as and, in each case. Yes. And the same when it repeats in the second section? Yes, yes. Thank you. This concert that you're giving tonight at Lincoln's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, one associates at once with law and lawyers. Am I right in thinking that you've had a number of very intimate contacts in your life with the law? Oh, indeed I have. I've <laughs> always been very friendly with lawyers. Friendly with them? Yes, and I've got well, great esteem for them. And have they done well for you, by and large? Oh, on the whole, exceedingly well. It has been an expensive Nearly sport, hasn't it? all people at the bar, or away from the bar, including ex-Lord Chancellors, have at some time appeared in the courts as my counsel, How? junior or senior. How many times have you been in court? Well, according to one man's computation, not so long ago, I figured in 591 legal cases. Of which I hope you won the majority. Uh, I don't know. Quite, <laughs> I think quite a number, yes. Quite yeah. a number. I think all I deserve to win. Yes. Tell me, how do you get the results that you do from the orchestra? Is it by the way you listen, by listening so sharply, that the orchestra feel they have to play well, or is it by pointing to them and telling them with your fingers what you want them to do? When you come to face the orchestra, signs are not very much. Facial expression is immense. The face and the eyes are everything. But more than that, there is a link between an intelligent player and a first-class orchestra, which, after all, the, this uh, orchestra is. Now then, these people notice my expression. Yes. And also, there's the link between us, mm -hmm. by which what I'm thinking, with fierce concentration, mm -hmm. everything in me, mm -hmm. that's communicated to them, and they know. Don't those men get more easily bored and weighed down by the routine performances that they're giving oh, another conductor five times a week? Well, I know, but that's inevitable. There are only three or four of us in the world who know how to conduct, really, anyway. And only three or four of us left. Never were more than a dozen of army days. Now, good God, every year someone uh, disappears. Fort Bangla, Toscanini, somebody else, 
Should stars are all going, persons I be left like Robinson Crusoe on a desert <laughs> island, without even a man Friday conducting. It's in a hopeless position. But it's you... a dying, it's a dying occupation. Why do you think that is? But where are they? Why aren't they? Well, they haven't got the brains or the musical concentration or any heart or soul significance in them. They don't feel the music. They're not born with it. They're not born with that absolutely burning devotion to music. They take casually, like gentlemen. Bah! Gentlemen. English gentlemen. I just let the people play. With some that's marvelous all, gestures. That's, that's what the or all the orchestral players say. Well, they asked everyone, well, now, what is it to do with this man? What does he do? And the answer is, he lets us play. Don't you sing to them occasionally? He lets us play. He doesn't stop us every, he doesn't stop us every five bars. He doesn't agitate us every ten bars for some idiotic movement. Mm. Why well, let them go on playing? But you actually enjoy the physical part of it. It must be thrilling to do the actual movements when you're carried away yourself. By I'm never one. carried away. I never? couldn't conduct if I were carried away. No? How can you be if you're carried away? How should you control an orchestra of a hundred people then if you're carried away? Well, I see you doing you thrilling do. gestures sometimes. Oh, sometimes. it's not the matter. That's all an act. But surely you can't expect a young conductor to arrive for a long while at that feeling of I ease don't. in front of an orchestra. Nobody audience. does. Nobody. Why should anybody expect a young conductor to do anything? Well, then he needs Conducting more rehearsal, doesn't he? Well, you may think so. Well, I don't think so, no. So he's lacking in method. There's only one way to rehearse it, an orchestral piece, which is what I do. What's that? I take either a Mozart symphony or a Strauss tone poem. I play the whole thing through from beginning to end without a stop. Oh, blessed thing. The orchestra makes a few mistakes, naturally. I play it through a second time. The orchestra makes no mistakes. I then just take a few little difficult parts. I pinpoint them. I emphasize them. I repeat those three or four times. I really perform. What does a young conductor do? Who will never profit by anybody else's experience, Natural. thanks to his unconquerable egotism and innate stupidity. Okay. He will take a first class book, so after playing 20 bars, he will stop and he'll begin educating them. Fancy educating a body of people like the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. They already know the damn piece ten lines better than he does. He goes on another 20 bar, stops, starts educating, teaching them. That's why he wants six rehearsals, and that's why I can do with two. Do you think that a young conductor who wants to develop into a great or orchestral conductor has his ear spoiled by the amount of jazz and rock and roll that he's bound to hear in the course of the day? Anyone who wants to be a musician at all, of any sort, and a conductor of even meagre accomplishment, one wouldn't be such a goddamn fool as to spend the rest of the day listening to rock and roll. He better go and jump in the river once and put an end to himself. Such a thing's inconceivable. All jazz? Jazz, what is it? Worn out old thing. It's already 50 years behind the times. As an artistic convention of any sort, however low, however feeble, how ridiculous, however boosted by the American gossip newspapers and swallowed by the most credulous public the world has ever known in Europe, still it was it was born dead. It's only all real use, all right for nightclubs and all that useless crowd of people who ought to be strangled at birth. Look here. In nothing. No profession, no occupation in the world, except psychiatrists. Are there so many prigs and humbugs mm. and intellectual scallywags as there are in the unfortunate industry, craft, and art of music? <laughs> the whole arena is littered with these dreadful asses. Well, Sir Thomas, thank you very much indeed. I hope you have a wonderful and exciting evening at Lincoln's Inn.
we felt the last word should go to Sir Thomas. Somebody once asked me at a public gathering in America what was good music, and I had to invent this answer. Good music is that which penetrates the ear with facility and quits the memory with difficulty.